just a little bit of this in relationship to understanding that David's tabernacle <clears throat> was set up on Zion. And you hear so much, especially in the Psalms, uh, but really throughout the Bible about Zion. <clears throat> and I don't think we really understand what Zion means in many cases. Uh, Zion is pointing to David's tabernacle. And uh, you can see that. Well, let's just start in the book of Psalms, Psalm 132. Um, and get a good example. This sort of tells the tale of uh, David's tabernacle. <clears throat> Psalm 132. And verse 13. <clears throat> and it says... Um, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. And then verse 14, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Um, <clears throat> several things. One is, is that the word rest is constantly tied to David's tabernacle, or another word that we use, Zion, okay? Constantly tied to it. <clears throat> and rest comes as a result of not being under the law, of not having to fulfill requirements. Um, and, uh, but, but, but more than that, I mean, that's true, that's, so true, and Zion is always talked about as a place of rest. Um, but it's um, verse 14, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. And so Zion to the Lord is a place of rest for him and for us. And it is also the place that he says, here will I dwell. Okay, now... <clears throat> Um, he never says that about Shiloh or Gibeon or anywhere Moses' tabernacle was. It's never connected with rest in that sense. However, the Holy of Holies was part of Moses' tabernacle. Remember the last class? And so why wasn't it connected with that? Since it's the Holy of Holies, since it's where God dwells, well, God God dwelt, as it were, as Moses' tabernacle. In his incarnation, he represented that tabernacle. <clears throat> but that's not his dwelling place. <clears throat> that body that he had was temporary in the sense of, and we've already used another class to explain, you know, when we say he changed bodies, um, he... Uh, still has his body just like we do, but we're the body of Christ. And we went through all that explanation, so if, if you weren't here for that, <clears throat> you can go through that. So I, I don't want to go back and re-explain uh, those things. <clears throat> but um, let me just read a little bit of it here. <clears throat> uh, Notice how David equates rest with Zion, where David's tabernacle resided. There were no parts to Moses's, or no parts to David's tabernacle that brought up sins and failures. There was nothing there that brought up sins and failure. Okay, <clears throat> and nothing that had come as a result of failure concerning the law. Now remember, in our last class. James pointed to David's tabernacle as the definitive answer that we are not under the law. Well, this is it. This is what we read in Hebrews. Clearly shows that he's talking about two separate covenants. We're all still, most Christians are all worried about the law and about failing God and doing all this stuff. And they're not concerned with the, becoming the dwelling place of God. Because it's not just about rest for us, it's rest for him because he has brought us into oneness and he doesn't have to work. We're not like a, 
you know, the picture I always get is Jesus said when he wept over Jerusalem, he said, you know, I would have gathered you as a hen her chicks. And <clears throat> most of us don't understand what that means, but, you know, some of us have tended chickens, and I did it as a missionary in Jamaica. And um, it was always amazing to me how uh, a mother hen she would have her chicks running all over and you'd be surprised how many they can have. And I mean, there's all these chicks and they're just like all over the place. There's no rest, man, they're going nuts. And, and there's no order, how do, you, how do you get them? But she would gather them all up and physically you couldn't even see the little chicks anymore. She would fluff out over them and they would all be gathered up into her as it were where they're no longer seen, they're one with her. And that's what Jesus meant when he wept over Jerusalem. He, he's weeping and saying, I would have gathered you as a hen her chicks, but you would not have it. And so um, this, is the, this is the difference between all of us running around like a chicken with our head cut off, trying to do the right thing and trying to be straight and trying to, you know, satisfy the law. Because... You know, we think we're trying to satisfy God, but we're trying to satisfy the law. Whereas when Christ begins to be formed in us, there's a rest. And that's what Zion, we just read it right here, that's what Zion represents. The rest that comes by union with him, by being that tabernacle in which the Lord dwells. And this is, this is the early... Um, early movements of God in transition. I mean, the truth is, once Jesus died and rose again, we were the body of Christ. But we'll get into all of that, but the truth is that didn't come up for a long time. They needed to settle this truth of the law first because it was huge because they were all Jews, see. And so, as we said, James settled the issue with the law with David's tabernacle. He didn't, he didn't settle it with um, Solomon's temple. He satisfied it with David's tabernacle and showed that what David did uh, did not break the law and that David would go into the Holy of Holies. He wasn't even of the tribe of Levi. They were, you're supposed to be of that tribe and Moses was and Aaron was and all of his sons were and all the Levites were Le of the tribe of Levi and here he was of the tribe of Judah and he would go in the Holy of Holies and dance before the Lord and sing and you, you, if you read the Psalms in light of that you will, you will see him continually saying you know I was freaked out I didn't know anything and then I went into the the house of the Lord and all this stuff, you know. and But he's talking about David's tabernacle and all this freedom and all of this reality that David had, he wasn't bound by the law. He he was very young when all this took place, you know, fairly young anyway. And, and uh, by the time he became king, though, and set this up, he set it up according to what he believed was already in the heart of God. If he believed that it was in the heart of God that God wanted this ark and the, and the Holy of Holies back connected to Moses' tabernacle, he would have brought it there. But he saw something beyond the old covenant. And we'll see that when we get over here to Solomon's temple. I don't want to give away too much. But later on, he realizes there's more. I thought this was it with David's tabernacle. He realizes there's, there's more here. And so he, he goes, I mean, he literally says, you know, God wants a house. So, um, so David's tabernacle is a transition into the full reality of what is ours by death and resurrection. Uh, let's see, let me make sure I've read all this stuff. Again, there are no parts in David's tabernacle that brings up sins or failures that were by the law. All consciousness of such things were gone from this tabernacle. In David's tabernacle, the law had been previously dealt with when it had been separated from Moses' tabernacle, given into the hands of the Gentiles, and risen out of that land into a new position 
into the promised land, which is Zion. See, all of that was this, this incredible, you know, it's like, it's like Moses' tabernacle was over here, and it was a history that took place, and there was going to be this brand new history that was going to take place where we would become the, the house of God, the temple of God, and he could live his nature through us and overcome all of our failures by life instead of by law. But before that was this taking of the art period, this, this time period where it was a glorious reality instead of just this horrible, we've lost the ark, you know? And, uh, and yes, there were horrible things that happened, but it was this, this separating, this literal, I mean, th this is really amazing when you think about it. The, the shadow was that they took the ark out and began the separation from Moses' tabernacle to eventually David's and then Solomon's temple. <clears throat> but in the reality, when they took Jesus and took him to die on the cross, they were separating, they were setting in motion the death of Judaism and of the law. They were, and the death of themselves, of us, crucified with Christ. So here they bring him out and they put him before Pontius Pilate. And they're doing all these things. And yet Jesus, he's not opening his mouth. He's not going, no, stop, don't murder me, you terrible people. He's not all caught up in that. He, the zeal for God's house was eating him up. He was so ready to bring forth ultimately God's house, not God's, as it were, tent. Um, so, uh, the holiest, which is David's tabernacle, is separated from the articles of furniture that represent the law. The veil is rent, and anyone can go in, but, just a little hint ahead, the veil is rent so anyone can go in, David's tabernacle, but in the temple, you're actually part of the structure. In David's tabernacle, the veil is rent and anyone can go in. It's a huge transition from David's tabernacle to Solomon's temple. Is it all really the same reality? Yes, but not in understanding, not in knowledge, not in grasping the reality of what this death and resurrection has accomplished. And let's face it, most people don't really, really see it in light of the way that it looks in this manner. And so they're, they're struggling and they're, they're, you know, they, they have a zeal for God. Isn't that what Paul said? They have a zeal for God, but not after knowledge. So they end up struggling and trying to do all this stuff, not knowing that if you would just be his temple, if you would, you know, starting with David's tabernacle, but moving into being his temple, then he... He can do all that stuff. What was it uh, that it said that uh, from Egypt to the promised land, it was an 11-day journey, 11 days. Now, I, I just want to ask you, why did it take 40 years then? 11, okay, let's do the math. 11 days. What? Yeah, or 12,000 days. Okay, why would it take so long from David's tabernacle to Solomon's temple? Well, in reality, it really didn't take all that long because that represents the transition and the dawning of it. But individually, what could take 11 days can be 40 years for us, you know, because, you know, I... I personally don't want to be fooling around in the wilderness, wandering around, going, where's God? What's happening? Why are you, why don't you give us some water? We're hungry. Give us quail. You know what I mean? I want to, know, I want to enter into the land that flows with milk and honey. <clears throat> All right. The ark being taken by the Philistines represented the time of the cross, the time when Jesus died as a curse for the law. 
Okay, so, you know, we, remember in Galatians, the book of Galatians deals with this transition. It deals with the law and with Christ. And he says in the very first chapter, he says, um, if anybody preached any other gospel than what we preach, let him be accursed. Okay. So we read that with our carnal minds and we go, my God, what is he, some sort of sorcerer? Throwing curses at us and, you know, just because we don't preach what he preaches. Well, he tells you what he preaches there uh, just right after that. He says, the gospel I preach is the revelation of Christ. And then he describes it in the next few verses and says, God revealed his son in me, not to me, in me. That's the gospel that he preached. So that means that if you're not living by Christ in you, you're under the law because it's you trying to live for God. And so he's saying, if you're, if you're preaching and going with any other gospel than what I'm preaching, you're already cursed. I'm not cursing you. He didn't say, I curse you. He said, let him be a curse because you're under it. You put yourself under a curse. And then in the third chapter, he spells all that out. That's where we get the clear-cut answer of how Christ became a curse for us, speaking of the curse of the law. So the, so the cursing there is not, you know, some sort of damnable thing that will happen to us if we don't preach Christ and Him crucified. It is the logical results of not comprehending and living according to, as it were, David's tabernacle, Solomon's temple, but still living over here in Shiloh. <clears throat> All right, so the subject of rest this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for a habitation. That's what it says. The Lord hath chosen Zion. The Lord doesn't want Moses' tabernacle. The Lord doesn't want you under the law. You say, well, you know, I don't want to be in it, but God is... You know, no, God is the one who does. God doesn't want you bound. Okay? If you are, it's not his fault because he doesn't want you that. Jesus died with the taking of the ark so that all that would end. <clears throat> all right. So the subject of rest can only, let's see, let me make sure here. Yeah, the subject of rest can only enter in when the requirements of the law have ceased demanding them. Rest comes not when you've kept all the law. Because you may, you know, the rich young ruler kept it all as far as he knew. But you break it in one point and that's it. You mean, if I just fail on one thing? Yeah, he, he considers you've broken the whole law. He doesn't look at you. Come on, think about that. He doesn't look at you as if you broke one thing piece of the law. That's the way most Christians look at it. They go, okay, I messed up on this, this issue here, but I kept this, this, and this, and this. God doesn't look at it like that. He never has and he never will. He says, if you messed up here, you broke the whole thing. You're under the law. You put yourself under the law by trying to keep those things and do them. So we are as if we broke all of them to God. And yet we go, well, I'm not so bad. I didn't, you know, we have all these excuses. We, yeah, we do, you know, we throw all this stuff out and we expect him to go, well, you did, you have done good and this and this and this and this. He goes, you broke it all. Well, what, you know, okay, so how the heck do we get out from under that yoke? And isn't that what they, ca they called it in Acts 15? You know, our forefathers couldn't bear this yoke, and so neither can the Gentiles. Okay. So what is their answer? Well, James's answer is, bingo, David's tabernacle. That's his answer. To become a habitation of God. To, 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 but that's not enough. Because we say, well, Je Jesus lives in me. No, but what do we live by? 
are we still, because we say Jesus lives in me, and so we're, we, we, we act sort of like we're the Holy of Holies, but we're still connected to the rest of the Moses' tabernacle. Do you understand what I'm saying with that? It's like, you know, we, I'm in the compartment, I've entered in, but yeah, but you're still, you know, yes. Even get into that second while the first is still standing. You see, so and it's not just in history, it's in, in us. When we are still embracing that kind of relationship, the revelation of Christ will always be something that's just out of reach, that we're always kind of having to read another book or have another dealing or see one more thing in the scripture. We can't get in there as long as we're relating in that first one. No. It's, it's <clears throat> off limits. Right, Ab absolutely. The Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holiest is not yet made manifest, not for you, not if that's, if that's your approach. And so, so, the, so I, and I'm saying all of this to try to separate in our minds from Moses' tabernacle. I'm trying to get us from Moses' tabernacle. Okay, here, it's like, okay, we say, well, I'm not in the outer court, you know, and I'm moving towards God, yeah, but you, you're, you're still not the holy of holies and he's living in you. You're somebody in Moses' tent trying to get to that. So there has to be what Mallory is just saying, and what we read last class in, in Hebrews 9, there has to be a break. And the break is where the Holy of Holies splits off and becomes David's tabernacle and leaves Moses' tabernacle where we're no longer under the demands that would require you to work your way through so that you can get in there. And again, just so you'll know, the greatest truth is it's not just trying to get into David's tabernacle. The true reality is, is that we're seeing from David's tabernacle that it has broken with that. The greater reality is, is that we are the temple of God, Solomon's temple. We're not trying, we're not in Solomon's temple trying to get in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Nor are we in the tabernacle trying to get in the Holy of Holies. We are more than Solomon's temple, only a shadow. We are God's temple. And that's pure holy of holies. And that's what we are, and he's the one who lives inside of us. Does that, does that make sense? Is there, is there sort of clarity coming? Hello? I see the lights on, but... All right, and don't think that just sitting, you know, being in this class, everything's going to go off and you're going to get it. I firmly believe that in preaching the word that we plant seeds, and those seeds will come up as, you know, some plant some water. As they begin to be watered and whatever, God will show you these things. It's, it's not important that you get what I'm saying, and I prayed that on the way here. I said, Lord... Talk to your people, you know, and, and the way that I prayed it was as if I wasn't even there, meaning he can say stuff to you that I'm not even talking about here because it's not about what I'm saying. However, what I'm saying right here is incredibly important. We're studying the tabernacle. We're studying, that's the subject of this. It's called tabernacle, but we've made it the progression, the spiritual and historical progression of the house of God, because what is the point of segregating off over here into Moses' tabernacle and just talking about that when it's not that? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so it's, okay, we're going to have a New Testament class on the Moses' tabernacle. Well, you say, well, it can't be a New Testament class. It's in the Old Testament that's exactly right. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. So why? And when I got ready to share it this time, 
the Lord said to me, I don't want you to, I don't want you to talk about the tabernacle. I want you to talk about the house of God and then talk about the tabernacle. And remember now, remember this. This Moses' tabernacle is only a shadow of Jesus incarnate walking among us. Jesus coming up to you and saying, don't do that anymore. Well, good luck. How's that working for you? You know? Yeah, really bad. That's right. Because Jesus outside of you, folks, let me just tell you this right now. Jesus outside of you is not um, good news. Because he, it's not, it's torment and torture because he's telling you to do stuff you can't do. Jesus inside of you is good news. The gospel, the good news, like I said, Paul in Galatians chapter 1 spelled it out. This is the good news that we preach, you know. Uh, and we, and oh, Sunday morning I preached on it too, and we were talking about Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory whom we preach. Whom is the Christ in you? He is clearly saying, I'm not preaching Moses' tabernacle, I'm preaching David's tabernacle, but more importantly, I'm preaching Solomon's temple. I'm preaching David's tabernacle so that you will break with the law. But once you're established in that, Gosh, there's so many things I want to just say right now that are just the word of God that was just light you up. But I, I can't. I don't want to jump too far ahead. But it's just incredible how these things, it's like a puzzle. And you get a few pieces and you start putting it together. And then you go, oh, you know. And then you go, the more pieces you put in, the more it's easier to go. Have you ever noticed that? When you first start out, you go, well, let's start with this one. I got one. <laughs> and everything got to, you know. And everything may not fit with that one. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we, every, but everything may not fit with us. So you end up with more over here. You get a piece working over here, and you go, well, I'm going to leave that one. This one seems to be the one where it's working here, you know. And then you, then you get a little piece of thing working over here, and then a little patch over here. And the, the fun starts when you can link one of those patches with another one. You go, yeah, we're on our way now. We're, we're moving out, you know. <laughs> Did I see a hand? Yes. I was just thinking, I had a picture when we were talking about Solomon's temple and, and that, that being kind of the goal that they're moving towards. David's tabernacle didn't have any of the elements dealing with sin. Right. But in Solomon's temple, we are members of that. You know, we are the building sure. of God's yeah, and yeah. It's all of that working within. So, mm -hmm. like Jesus was, you know, like Moses' tabernacle. So, anytime anything that was of the flesh or from the outside came in contact with him, all that judgment, I mean, those elements, if you will, I've just seen him as a picture of that. Yeah. He had yes. the, the altar and all those things working in him. Yeah. And so it was like every time anything came in contact with that, it wasn't good news for, like you were saying. And the same thing kind of happens as, as we go through this progression and become that member of Solomon's temple. That, like when stuff, you know, that, that I, I don't know, the picture that I had was that, like, that judgment is not working on the outside at me, but it's now working in me so that those things get dealt with. Not just not just like in me, but the other things coming in from the outside. I don't know if that's No, no, that's that's great. The, the the way the Lord showed me that was <clears throat> when you separated the Holy of Holies from Moses' tabernacle, it became David's tabernacle, it became the Holy of Holies. And what was in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. Ah, but what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, it, we read that in Hebrews 9. Well, you know, there were several things. The, the golden pot with the manna, Aaron's rod that budded. Oh, wait a minute. The law, the Ten Commandments were inside of the Ark, which represents Christ. And, and there you've got a tent or, or a tabernacle in the sense, David's tabernacle. That represents us. And then you've got the Ark. That represents Christ. And then you've got him fulfilling and by life on the inside being able to fulfill, not keep the law. It's not outside where you keep it. It's inside where it's fulfilled by life, by nature. And that's the life on the inside of the tabernacle or, or the temple, if you will. 
And, and ultimately, you, ultimately, you need to see Solomon's temple, not, not necessarily Solomon's temple, but God's temple, the one that he's after, as a, just a great big holy of holies. Okay. With Christ in it and him having all this written in his heart, being in our life, therefore in our heart, and all of it springing forth like a, what do you say? Living waters coming out of us. All right. Um, <clears throat> see if I got all this. Well, here's the next one. At the cross, the law is put away, and all, and as far as an external, and all we have left to live by is the life of God found in the Holy of Holies as represented by David's tabernacle. All right. So turn with me real quick to Philippians, and we'll see this. Philippians chapter 2. Or maybe you know it better as Philippians. <clears throat> That's why I call Malachi Malachi. <laughs> I love teaching from there and saying, well, turn to the book of Malachi, and everybody goes, what? <laughs> Philippians, Philippians, chapter 2, and all right, get ready. Are you ready for this? Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What do you think? Does that sound like David's tabernacle? It does. It does. That's, that's where it's happening. That's the new covenant. And he said, I will make a new covenant with them after these days, saith the Lord. I will write my laws in their heart. I will tell it or not. And uh, what, gosh, I was just thinking of a scripture oh, in between our classes. I can't. I remember the second part of it, that, but I, the first part's important to what I was going to say. All right, verse 13, for it is God who worketh in you. Okay, so he's in you, and there he's doing the, the work. And what is the work that he's doing in you? He, what does this say? He's shaping you up. He's making you perfect. He's making you do everything right. No! He's the one forming in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure, and that's happening by God, right? Not by you, but by God in you. Yes. Amen. <laughs> no more consciousness of sins. <clears throat> Amen. Well, okay, but then you, we read that, and it does say that in the Bible, no more consciousness of sin. Then what are we conscious of? I mean, in, uh, what sh how about this? What should we then be conscious of? Christ. But not Christ in heaven because that doesn't help us. Christ in us. Whether Christ is in heaven or he's walking among us in the incarnation, it's still condemnation until it can be fulfilled. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk. <clears throat> anyway. All right, so, um, and I think that's such a great scripture because just before, you know, it's talking about working out your own salvation and stuff like that. <clears throat> For it is God who worketh in you. It tells you to do something and then tells you how. Work out your own salvation. For it is God who worketh in you. But we don't get that. We go, oh, okay, I'm... I'm working it out. And it's, it, what's funny is it says with fear and trembling, but I can go into a lot of explanation of that. But Paul said, when I came to you, I came in weakness and in trembling and, you know, in his own weakness so that Christ would be his strength. We, but again, we go, oh, oh, God, you know, well, that's the law. That's what it says in Hebrews. We have not come unto Mount Zion where there's, you know, loud noises and, and a javelin being thrown at you and all of this condemnation heaped on you because the law is up there and you're down here and you ain't doing so good. But we've come where? Mount where? David's Tabernacle. 
Mount Zion. Well, what does that mean? It means that we've come to be the house of God and the life that lives within us fulfills all that God wants. It is God worketh in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so, um, uh, notice in our verse that it, it is now God at work within us. We are at rest. The tabernacle's not doing anything. It is only being, uh, <clears throat> it is yielding to life. Yielding to life. <clears throat> the, the, uh, it, let's see, the use of the word uh, working, because let's see, verse, uh, verse 13 again, for it is God who worketh. It is God who worketh. Okay, this word working is really the word energizing. Really, look it up. It's not some sort of legalistic law thing that you got to go do some works. It is the energy within you. It is God energizing within you to do and of His good to do in the will of His good pleasure. He's the energy which accomplishes these things in us and therefore through us. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, so if he's energizing us, then we are at rest. If he's the energy, he's not energizing us, but he's the energy within us that's accomplishing this, then we are at rest. It, and then I put, it's his energy in us. <clears throat> I don't know, anybody ever get tired of doing religious stuff? You know, well, instead of quitting... Seek Jesus. You know, well, I'm sick of this. I'm just going to quit. Well, that's the Lord. <laughs> you know, but it seems so right. Well, that's just religious crap. I don't, I don't abide by this stuff. <clears throat> Good. Then abide in Christ and let Christ abide in you. <laughs> All right, so therefore the requirements of do no servile work are fulfilled by Christ's energy at work in us. In other words, the law is not done away, it is fulfilled. Jesus said that. I didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill. Does that make sense? By his own life and energy. That's why the law is in the ark, because he, it's life to him. It's the way that he does. So it says, thou shall not kill. The law says thou shall not kill. The new covenant says Christ lives in you. Guess what? You won't kill. <laughs> You'll die for them instead of killing them. <laughs> well, that's the way of Christ. All right. <clears throat> How much time we got? Okay, well, we're going to try to cut it short since we did this before, but we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> um, uh, his life is the energy from within. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> and verse 10. Tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. <clears throat> Hebrews 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Okay? And, and the fulfillment of that, folks, is the new covenant and the new covenant is that he is on the inside, and we're the house of God. You got it? See, he's talking, this is the covenant I made with the house of Israel. There's a difference between the house of Israel and the house of God. Folks, that's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a difference between Solomon's temple, though Solomon's temple is the historical pattern and shadow. We are not, Sol we are not the fulfillment of Solomon's temple in the sense of being Solomon's temple. We are 
the temple of God, the true meaning, the true holy of holies uh, in which Christ dwells. And uh, I, re I remember I said, you know, I don't visit a whole lot of churches other than to go preach, but I remember during a worship service they were singing, and the song that they were singing was, you know, Oh, Lord, give us the wisdom of Solomon. And I thought, man, I don't want the wisdom of Solomon. I want the wisdom of God. I want Christ made unto me wisdom. I don't, you know, what would I do with the wisdom of Solomon, you know? Oh, I know how to fix that. I mean, that's great, but I still would be devoid of Christ. What would you say, Melanie? <laughs> that's right. I'd know how to, you know, divide the baby. No, no, don't, don't cut it that way. Cut it this way. <laughs> Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> Sorry. <that. laughs> okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of your heart. <clears throat> and all of this being that if Christ is in you, the law is fulfilled by his life. It's not fulfilled, it's not kept by our will. Amen. That is Moses' tabernacle. God tells you what his will is, and you better do it right. And if you don't, you know, you offer the wrong kind of fire, psh, two of your sons die. You see what I'm saying? This is the, not that anymore, not Moses coming down and saying this is the way to do it, but Jesus fulfilling those things by his life within us. <clears throat> All right. His laws are written on our hearts. By his life, our thinking our motives, our words, our attitudes, and our relationships with others are set in tune with God's requirements. But by life and by nature, we are the vessel through which he reaches. When we say we want to be his vessel, we're asking to be more than just his messenger. There's a lot of, a lot of churches that go, oh, Lord, I just want to be your vessel. You know, They're just saying, I just want to be your messenger boy or something like that. No, the Bible clearly says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the treasure is Christ, so that the excellency of the power will be God and not us. So I put him in there so that he can do it. <clears throat> but by saying all this, we're going beyond David's tabernacle and jump, jumping ahead to the full establishment of Solomon's temple, which we are. So, in summary of David's tabernacle, let me read this, and then we shall be through for the night. And we will be through with our study of David's tabernacle, and next class we'll move into Solomon's temple. The tabernacle of David is where the individual can go in and meet with God face to face. Amen? That's something that they never could before. The result of that new freedom is that we are changed from glory to glory into the same image, made one with him. But we become, the, we become the body and he becomes the life. We become the vessel and he becomes the treasure. We become the branch and he becomes the life in the branch. We become the body. You see what I mean? Every, every example, the temple, he becomes the... This is all the main examples that we use in the church and yet no one's really preaching Christ in you. They're just, you know, you, you know. <clears throat> So uh, the result of that new freedom is that we're changed from glory to glory into that same image. That, that accomplishes two things. Meaning, okay, in case, just so you can follow. David's tabernacle set up. David's outside of it or anybody else. David goes in, and when he passes in there, he's with the Lord. Well, in the New Testament, it says... When we behold him, we are changed from glory to glory into the same image. Now, I don't know if that happened with David, but I know it happens with us. You following that? Okay, so here's my point then. If we're changed, then that accomplishes two things.
First, we become free to enter into rest in relation to the requirements of the law. And that's the main thing James was trying to point out. Okay? Second, Christ begins to be formed in us as individuals. Right? Because as you enter in, you know, I can enter in and you're not changed. David's tabernacle primarily is about an individual going in there and beginning to be changed into his image. Okay? Because if you're not going to be under the law, then it's going to be Christ formed in you. So you have to be conformed to his image. Okay? Because it's the Holy of Holies, David's tabernacle, not Moses' tabernacle. <clears throat> All right. So, so, second, Christ begins to be formed in us as individuals. But, Though these two things are wonderful, there's still something lacking. There's a difference between individuals having the Lord in these ways and that of the body of Christ being formed together to become a permanent dwelling place. There yet needs to be another transition to take place, this time from David's tabernacle to Solomon's temple. Okay? So... We are on the last leg of our journey. Deb told me I think I've got four. Okay. Well, may the Lord grant us grace and mercy. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. He's our teacher, and we are not adequate for these things individually <clears throat> or corporately. But we are your body. We're already one with you. <clears throat> Even as the comprehension of David's tabernacle was all in line with being one with you, we are one. And this is not about us. This is not about how good or how we do everything perfect but it is about your son and it's about your son in us. It is that we are different than the Jews. We need to be about Christ. We need to be about knowing him, not in some far away like the Jews did, but by knowing who we are, we ultimately come into knowing him, being changed, being, becoming the vessel becoming the bride, becoming the body, becoming all of these things so that his life can flow out of us and produce fruit, produce what needs to be produced. And so instead of uh, striving, instead of striving not to strive, we just ask you to reveal your son in us and to open your word and to make it plain so that we see as you wrote it because you're the author and not as religion has taught it. And so we, we put ourselves into your nail-scarred hands and we trust that because they're nail-scarred, it's your full intention to bring us in the fullness to, of what you already bought and paid for at Calvary. Every time we see those hands that we put our things into, it, it just screams loudly how much you want us to enter into this and to what lengths you went that we might. We love you. We know you love us. And so um, knock down the walls and the misconceptions and the things that have actually kept us from the very thing that we cry out for. We look to you in faith and in patience, waiting, waiting for the day dawn and the day star to arise in our hearts. We ask it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're dismissed.